Aloha and welcome to Figments, The Power of Imagination. It's great to be back after two weeks. And as I'll, I'll remind viewers that I'm going to revert to that every two week schedule and only show the Figments, Power of Imagination segments just because I can only do so much. I'm really excited about today's episode. I'm always excited about the episodes, but this one in particular, because there's a personal connection and an incredible professional respect for my guest as we talk with Dr. Oriana Schuyler Mastro, a dual role scholar about her and what she does and what she thinks. But first, let me tell you that um, this episode, like all episodes of Figments, The Power of Imagination is intended to entertain and inspire you with mostly guests that I've known over my lucky life and uh, share that with you. And the, the real key to my success thus far with over 3,500 views is to get people on who are smarter than I am. And that's a, a big plus for the viewers. Big plus for me, too, because I've gotten to know some extraordinary people. And one of them is Dr. Oriana Schuyler Mastro. Oriana, aloha. How are Hi. you? Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. We go way back 14 years. I did the math. It took me about an hour, but, you know, 2008. Yeah, I think it's 14 years. Yeah, um, indeed. And when I first met you, I was speaking as at the end, I think, of my tenure as the deputy commander at U.S. PACOM at Naval War College at a Chinese Military Capability Forum. And you were in the crowd, right? Yeah, no, that's correct. I was invited to this conference. The organizers had read a volume I had edited the year before on cross-trade balance. You know, we still cared. We, we were talking about Taiwan, you know, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, too. And this was the first conference I'd ever been invited to. I was a Really? First I didn't year, know that. Yeah, I was a first-year PhD at Princeton. And so they asked me as if huh. it was nothing. But I was like, I have to go. But I had, like, no money. So I, you know, drove uh, through the night to Rhode <laughs> Island from Princeton, New Jersey, and stayed in, like, a $30 a night motel so I could show up at this conference to talk to other people about the Chinese well, military. I'm sure glad you did, because after I gave what I thought was a great speech, I always do. You may not remember any of it, but um, you and several other young scholars gathered around, and... We spoke, and it was just kind of work in the crowd thing for me. You told me you were interested in military service, specifically the Air Force. Right. So I had just finished, after the first year of my PhD at Princeton, I did a summer associate program at the RAND Corporation, mm -hmm. which is a think tank that is associated with the U.S. Department of Defense. They do really in-depth research for the Department of Defense. Um, and I spent the whole summer translating Chinese space doctrine for them. So what I learned is, love their work not interested in sitting in a cubicle doing translations for the rest of my career. Um, but they, some individuals there had suggested that I get even more military experience or closer to the military at that point that had been the closest to anything sort of defense or military that I had done. And so by the time we met, I was thinking about the next summer. I was thinking about the next steps. I was mm -hmm. thinking, ah, oh, maybe it'd be great to come out to Hawaii, do an internship. Maybe I should, you know, think about, and actually, I didn't come to you saying I was interested in the Air Force. You suggested to me that I should join the Air Force, okay. which I thought... Well, I, given my age, I'm allowed to misremember. <laughs> which I thought was a crazy idea. I didn't know anything about the military. So I thought, oh, I'm not 18. I don't know if you remember this, but I was like, I'm not 18. I can't join the military. And you you're said, a, you let me... An, an ancient whatever. Right, ancient lady. 20, 23 year old. But then you said, let me put you in touch with someone to, you know, educate you on your, your options. And then, yeah, we took it from there. And the rest is, is great history. And um, what you do in the military isn't your legacy. It's the people you enable. And I think one of the best contributions I've made to our Air Force is that contribution. You're now a major in the Air Force Reserve. Right. Um, but from that conversation, you sought an officer's commission and got it. And uh, I don't remember how many years, but it was a process. It didn't happen instantly. Right. Yeah. I mean, I had to take a year of leave from my Ph.D. program in two segments for officer school and until school. So, yeah, it, mm -hmm. it seems quite, quite involved. And it was a huge just personal challenge and, and change for me. It changed the direction of my career in many ways. 
and the reason that I did this wasn't just because she told me of, that she was attending, had attended one good school, Stanford, was doing her PhD at Princeton, another, I am told, pretty good school at Princeton, um, but because there's something about you that told me that not just about your abilities, but your um, depth and in that conversation, I got it. And I was right for once in my life. I was right. I was wrong about the Packers versus the 49ers Saturday. But uh, you went to um, OTS and you did OK, right? Uh, I, you know, I'd have to say it was a, a bit of a wake up call. There's a lot of things sure. that I had to learn how to do. You know, I learned how to be a better team player. I learned yeah. a lot more about leadership. And in that course, they, they selected me as the OT wing commander. Um, so that was a, picture, a picture of me yeah. sort of leading Big the other deal. cadets uh, on commissioning day. So I had that opportunity. Um, I won the academic award or leadership of award course. while I was there. Yeah. But, you know, there was so much learning to be had. I remember being called into the, um, my commander's office. He wanted to talk to me about my academic performance. And I was like, this is... A, I was <laughs> I've like, had that I, happen, but in a different <laughs> sort of a... <laughs> and I thought like, and I said to him, I was like, I don't understand. I ace all of my tests. And he said, but no one else in your flight does. And that's when I started to learn ah. about how thinking about the whole unit that, you know, it wasn't good enough that I was just thinking of myself and how to excel myself. Like, why wasn't I trying to help those around me? And, and it wasn't just me helping them. Believe me, the amount of time right. that those other OTs spent trying to teach me how to march and do other things to help me get through officer mm -hmm. school. But it was that mentality of doing it as a team that, that, you know, I hadn't really gotten before that really changed well, my well, outlook. That's, that's a beautiful memory. And, uh, it's a, it's a great encapsulation of what people should learn from their military experience about worry about yourself, take care of yourself, perform as yourself, as an individual, but it doesn't matter if the team fails. Mm. So anyway, we could talk uh, forever about your military performance. You were the individual uh, outstanding company grade officer of the year, I think something for the, the Air Force Reserve. Uh, but right now you're a center fellow at this, I'm going to mispronounce this, Spogli Institute. The Freeman Spogli Institute. At Thanks, Stanford, Spogli. Yeah. The G is not silent. That's what I was wondering <laughs> about. For international studies at Stanford, you're also a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. You write extensively a lot. I'm trying to read it. I'm working on it, okay? Um, and uh, so you, you are truly dual role. You're uh, an academic and you're a military professional, but your research is centered, and I'm going to really encapsulate this because it is broader than this, China, China military, China security, and conflict resolution. I'll call it that, but as you know from your book, that's really complex. Right. Your passion, you told me when we spoke earlier, is the Chinese military in terms of understanding it. How did that become your passion? How did, how did somebody who wasn't even thinking about being in the military when we mm -hmm. met come to take the Chinese, uh, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, on as an area of passionate study? You know, that's a question that a lot of people, I think my parents have asked me that question multiple <laughs> times. Um, I, you know, I originally, when I went to Stanford as an undergrad, I, I was very artsy. I actually got in partially for drama and piano, and I enrolled in this special program that, like, the nerds of Stanford enroll in <laughs> called Structured Liberal Education, which was all, like, philosophy and literature. Mm -hmm. You know, I was taking ancient Greek and Latin. I loved all that stuff. Um, and I started taking Chinese my freshman year because I loved languages. I spoke some romance languages and I thought oh I want to learn a different language and this one seems hard uh, I knew nothing about China um, at that point I started taking mainly courses on Chinese history and literature and then I took a year off in the middle of my undergraduate experience to go to China for the year to do an intense Chinese immersion course mm -hmm. and that's when I sort of discovered modern China I was like but that's not oh, the PLA gosh. so what no. where was the transition point to security 
Well, I got back, and it turns out there's not a lot of Americans without close connections to family in China who are fluent in Chinese. So I got flooded with requests from the intel and defense community in the United States saying you should come work Mm. for us. And that wasn't right for me in that moment, but I had never taken kind of a course in international security before. So I applied and got into a program at Stanford, an honors program in international security at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. And I spent a year just thinking about security issues. And I loved every minute of it. I mean, it was just like a natural, I just wanted to hear more and more. Um, And then I got my first job out of college as a junior fellow at a think tank in DC at the Carnegie Endowment, where I spent the whole year working on that Mm -hmm. volume about cross-strait balance of power. And I just thought, oh man, I want to learn everything there is to learn. And being young and naive, I thought, I'll be fluent in Chinese and then I'll know everything in like two to three years and then I'll move on to something else. But it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. And here I am, you know, 20 years later, you know, still doing it. I was actually just talking to my Chinese tutor for an hour right before we met. So it's like a never ending uh, cycle of, of learning. Well, learning Chinese is one thing, but being fluent enough to, and I remember this from one of our early conversations, to debate in Chinese, I think I'm Voice of America. Do I remember that? That's yeah, something that because I know yeah. just enough to to poorly wish Gung Shi Fa Chai Shin and Kuala kind of Happy New Year stuff. Um, and to, please don't correct me. All right, don't 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 correct my pronunciation. But to be able to think and speak on complex issues in the flow of a conversation that's unusual. Yeah, it took it took a lot of time in undergraduate, and then. Mm-hmm. You know, it's part of being at the bottom of the totem pole, you know, being other people's research assistants for 12 years, Mm. you know, working in places like Rand. Do I have the discipline to sit and translate Chinese military doctrine for eight hours straight? No, I do not. But when it's my job, you know, then you kind of have to. So in the earlier days, I had these incentives in which this is how I got in the door was with my Chinese language. You know, back then, no one cared what you know, undergraduate or out of Astro thought about China. So that was my way to get in, to learn, to build my expertise. And then from there, um, I, you know, I got more opportunities to broaden. But the Chinese language was definitely a critical part of that career trajectory. So um, I've skipped over. We have more pictures to show, mm-hmm. but um, I, I have to respect your time. You've testified to Congress 11 times. <laughs> Yes, I have to. That's the last count I did at Congress or, com, or, or congressional committees, because I also have a yeah. U.S. China Committee on Security and Economics. I've testified for them uh, and I've testified for both the majority and the minority. So I take that as a point of pride that yeah, they, they both right. call me in. And, and I would take that as a point of pride. I was the chief advocate for the F-22 for three and a half years, and I haven't been to Congress, Congress that many times. So. More I've also, I've you. also, I've also testified. I've also eaten one of the few people apparently to eat a meal while testifying because they had <laughs> me there for three and a half hours, and I was thirty six weeks pregnant, and I was like, "All right, guys, like Deep I food. need a snack." Okay, um, here, key and I question. breastfed my way through a congressional testimony too. So okay. you know, both uh, of those are also in your online bio. You need to flesh that thing out and get the details in there. What was the meal? Oh, I don't even remember. I mean, I was, I was like, I I was a very hungry pregnant person. And, and, you know, with the breastfeeding, one of the great things about COVID is everything was done through Zoom. And so for the eight Uh, months for my second kid, I did all sorts of things. And until he got a bit older and his hand would like creepily like sneak up in the screen, like no one would notice. (laughs) There was a couple of times that happened and I'd be like, you know, or to be really loud. I'd be like, okay, you got to calm down. Like mom has to talk about Chinese maritime ambitions of the House Foreign Affairs. Oh, I love it. Um, but, you know, so, uh, it had to be just done. To, just to expand on it, you know, we uh, uh, we have to gloss over because we want to talk China about the whole Oriana, but you're a mom. Uh, uh, we had, uh, Alejandra and I had a lovely dinner with you and Arzan and Kailua. You have a full life and good for you. Well, yeah, those are my boys. I do everything yeah. for those boys. Well, good, good for you, and and I'm I'm happy, proud, thankful to know you. I got to take a break so we can talk about China. So give me thirty seconds, Oriana. 
All right, Figments, the power of imagination, back again in two weeks. And my guest will be Pete Gumatautau, Rear Admiral Retired and the Director of Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, Daniel K. Inouye, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. One of my favorite places. I was the director there for five years. Pete's going to update us and tell us how APCSS changes the world. Uh, tune in. Pete's a great guy, the right guy to fix what I broke, and uh, you'll enjoy it. So uh, back to Oriana. Now on to real stuff about China and uh, your clear view. I called that because, as I said earlier, I think it's thoroughly researched and thoughtfully objective. Um, how do you do that? How do you keep your politics out? How do you not build an agenda? Uh, uh, as I got ready for this show, I thought, well, I don't think she has an agenda. Do you have an agenda? Did I miss that? I, you know, I, I don't. And people kind of don't believe it. But I think over the years, <laughs> I've, I've, I've demonstrated that. I mean, the bottom line is this issue is way too important. For politics. This Amen. is, you know, competition with China and ensuring that the United States, its interests in security and those of our allies and partners is protected goes beyond anything else. And this is something I came to realize when I was an undergraduate living in Beijing. This is one of the main mm. reasons I didn't go into business like the rest of my colleagues. I, I thought we need people to manage this relationship moving forward. And, uh, and I thought I could do it better than most, you know? So that's what I was really right. committed to. And every time I, I have an issue and I'm trying to figure out what's the best thing for the United States or our allies to do, it, I really have to be as sure as I possibly can, which means getting as much information uh, and you know, analyzing things with such rigor so that when I make a recommendation or I make an argument, I'm confident uh, because at, at least at this stage of my career, I'm lucky enough to have some influence within various governments that things, to things move a bit, you know, not all, you know, not maybe drastically, but things do move uh, when I make uh, certain remarks. And so I really need to feel like I'm correct and there's no room for politics and good empirical analysis. Uh, amen. And I, you know, the value of being self self-critical, not in a, um, self-flagellation sort of sense, but in saying, will this argument hold up? I'm, as you know, I'm writing my memoirs, I'm soon to be a major motion picture, I'm sure. But I was writing about the F-22 and how we arrived at the number of 381. And my number one goal was to produce analysis for the right number of F-22s that would withstand any argument. I didn't know what the right answer was. And, and your approach to your research always shows that. I, I do want to mention that. I'll mention it, and then we'll go on to China. Uh, you wrote a, an award-winning book about peace talks during conflict, and uh, it's an area I'm very interested in, but a, a really thoughtful piece. And I encourage readers to go to her website, uh, which we showed on the screen at some point, I'm sure, or will. Uh, but but we need more people to do objective analysis of conflict resolution and making peace because it's really hard. It's much harder than making war. But on to China. Yeah. Um, given your thoughtful, objective, and exhaustive studies of the Chinese challenge, what's their intent? What is Xi Jinping's intent if you had to divine it from what you've learned? So I actually think that this is, in some cases, the easiest question to answer and shouldn't be Good. particularly controversial, which is China wants to accumulate enough power to be able to make whatever decisions it deems best for itself at whatever time with minimal pushback. The Chinese call this strategic space. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's some things that Xi Jinping, the Communist Party, that China 100% has decided they want right? Like unification with Taiwan. But I don't think they've had this like a hundred year plan or 200 year plan in which they know every step of exactly what they want their role right. in the world right. to be. I think they're testing it out. You know, they're doing the whole Deng Xiaoping picking up stones while they cross the river, but they do know that they don't like to be deterred. They don't like the United States or other countries to step in the way to try to shape their choices. 
they want to be able to do what they think is best for them. And so I'm working on mm -hmm. my second book, which looks at how they've been able to build power over the past 25 years to go from, you know, an insignificant country when you look at economic, political, military stats mm -hmm. back in the early 1990s to a great power today. I mean, that is, that is an impressive feat, one that only a handful of countries have, have been able to achieve in all of modern you know, human history. And so I think it's worth studying how the Chinese uh, managed it. Let's deconflict our book releases so mine has some hope of selling a few <laughs> copies. Um, well, what, what, yeah, and, and I applaud your use of the term unification by reunification. We can mm -hmm. talk about that later. But um, given that, that what I would describe as a very self-centered view from the CCP, you know, it's kind of it's focused on what's best for them. Uh, what worries you the most with regard to China and U.S.-China relations? So before I answer, I should also mention a controversial point, which is I think that Chinese territorial ambitions are very limited. I think that mm. if you gave them the South China Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan, that would be the end of it. You know, we, mm. we they wouldn't then be trying mm. to occupy Japan or occupy Australia. But my view is that even those limited ambitions are too much because given the U.S. interests in Asia, we cannot have a potentially hostile power controlling all of that territory. And of course, it would be uh, not to the advantage of the people of, you know, of, of the island of Taiwan, for example. So you know, my main concern is I don't see a way to square this circle. The Chinese have mm. decided that they cannot achieve their goals as long as the United States still has a role in Asia. And the United States has decided that we can't protect our security and our interests if we don't have a role in Asia. So how those are just fundamentally conflicting interests. Uh, so a lot of people talk about, you know, inadvertent escalation, conflicts that happen by mistake. You know, I'm not worried about those. I'm worried about deliberate and purposeful conflict between these two sides because China comes to the conclusion that the only way it's going to get the United States out of its way is to, you know, push it out of its way. Wow. So I just, I don't see, I have recommendations for how to push conflict down the road. And then hopefully I come up with more ideas in a couple of years from now. But I've yet to come up with a strategy that ensures that war does not happen between us and China, you know, indefinitely. Wow, I'm going to take some time to process that after the episode. I think it's very thoughtful and insightful. Does anything give you hope uh, other than that you may have time to craft those those measures yeah. that will get us beyond war, beyond conflict? Yeah, so what really gives me hope is in spite of both this administration and the last administration, so it's not you know one party, right. but I do think the Republicans tend to do it a bit more, ideology has not played a major role yet in this competition. Mm -hmm. There is not a vilification of China. Now, the Trump administration did kind of go that direction a bit, which they were you know, talking about the Communist Party and the Communist Party is separate from the Chinese people. And the Communist Party is evil, but the Chinese people are not. Like, of course, you need a degree of those separations, but it, it tends to understate the degree to which the average Chinese person supports China's great power ambitions, right? right. Like, Right. Unification with Taiwan, it's not like that's something the party pushes and the average Chinese person is not super excited about. But the bottom line is that, at least this is anecdotal, I haven't done extensive research, but it doesn't seem like the average American hates Chinese people. And from my interactions in China, it's not like the Chinese hate Americans. So we haven't reached in this competition an emotional component or an emotional level um, you know, our different political mm -hmm. systems create some issues, but ideology hasn't been at the center. And that gives me hope that we can sit down and work something out. And, and the, I was thinking today about conflicts I've been involved in, and there, there's a great danger in personalization of conflict mm -hmm. and, and, and vilification. I, you know, we weren't alive in World War II. Um, but in conflict since there has been a vilification of our adversaries and you can't you can't just pick and choose you know if you vilify the japanese emperor or the japanese leader um, that that creates a different dynamic that makes peace even more difficult 
that's a very complex topic. So uh, before we go, and I know you have uh, very important duties to pick up one of your kiddos at, uh, at daycare. Um, the, you're a woman, a very powerful, strong woman, uh, and that was part of just the, the, the person you are, regardless of gender, is part of what made me want you to serve our country. Uh, but you're still in a pretty male world. How, how's the experience been being the smartest person in the room, which I, uh, you know, you can deny, but I'm pretty sure you always are. And so what's that like as a woman when you go into a conference or meeting or how do you feel about truly equal opportunity and equal acceptance of your input from your experience thus far in any realm? You know, it's exhausting. It is mm. like, I think it is absolutely exhausting. The equal input, you know, I always say you really, I really have to have the power of argument because mm. the bottom line is when I walk into a room, none of the men in there want to hear what I have to say about war. That is that pisses me off. Oh, but that is the yeah. assumption. Yeah, I mean, you I should know. hear the death threats I get on mad. Twitter when I go on TV to talk uh, about war. You know, this is a whole separate issue. You know, our male colleagues don't get, you know, I get, you know, really creepy handwritten letters, you know, delivered to my office at Stanford. You know, men don't have to deal with, with any of that. Even, you know, years later, I still get asked if I want to take notes in meetings. Um, yeah, we busy, talk, we, we yeah. talked about that at dinner, so I'm going to interrupt you, and I know we have to finish on time. I'm going to interrupt you to say how stupid and short-sighted that is of the American security community, so let me just talk about that. A, a country that still does that is hurting itself, so this is not political correctness. We need every great mind we can find and a diversity across our population to craft and implement our security solutions or we'll fail. So I'm going to be angry, thanks to you, Oriana, for the rest of the day because it's it's stupid and self-defeating. So right. So, I so I, you know, how many times I miss instead of doctor. That's why when I, you know, I send a media yeah. guide yeah. to remind people, like, I, you don't have to use titles, but if you're using titles... Don't exactly. call this man who doesn't have a PhD a doctor, but then give me miss. I mean, all of this is to say, when we think about strategy, China, there's so much mirror imaging happening. And I think mm -hmm. diversity mm -hmm. at home is so important because it's not surprising to me if individuals cannot conceptualize that someone's sitting next to them for whatever reason, gender, religion, socioeconomic upbringing, you know, sexual identity, whatever it is, that someone else's experience, desires, um, skills that are different than theirs, then I'm not surprised that they are incapable of understanding that what China wants, how China competes, is fundamentally different than what the United States is doing. So I think we need this diversity of mindset to help us be better strategists. And so better strategists than a more complete exemplar. Exactly. Yes. And, you know, I go through these phases of, you know, when I'm the only person at the table, right, talking about China, which is which has happened a lot. I'm at a table I'm with sure. a lot of yeah. important people. My first response is to feel very self-important. You know, like look at me. I get to make all these decisions, but very quickly that follows with like, am I the best and only person who can do this? Like, where are the other people? And this is why also most women don't even fight to get to this point, you know, where yeah. I am. Like it and won't they get worn out, you know, yeah. it's too hard to get tenure when you're trying to have kids. It's too hard to fit in your military service when they make it hard for you to bring your kids with you and you're doing your duty, all this stuff. It's exhausting, but, but we but need all it. the great minds. You've done it and you have a kiddo to pick up. So I'm going to cut you loose. I'll close. I am so grateful, not just for having you on uh, figments, but that you're serving our country and that I have the pleasure of knowing you and, and, learning from you um oriana thanks so much give my best stars on and give the boys a hug and avoid the virus and everything else and perhaps we'll do this again sometime of course sir the pleasure was mine anytime great to chat all right i'm going to clear you off i'll close the show thanks oriana take care folks this is another segment a segment of figments the power of imagination in the can and um the uh, 
the next episode, as I said, will be Pete Guma Tau Tau. I look forward to seeing you there on Figments, The Power of Imagination. Aloha. <laughs>